Now, while Helen and Paris are sailing towards Troy, back in Greece, word spreads rather quickly about what Paris had done. And I'm sure the people of Greece were both shocked and probably pissed off about it. I mean, who the hell is this prince to come and take another man's wife? And I'm sure it wasn't too long after all the gossip uh, got around that the messengers from uh, Menelaus and Agamemnon started to show up across the kingdoms and cities of Greece, basically to inform the princes and heroes and kings who took the oath of Tyndarius that now it's time to fulfill your oath to defend the marriage of Menelaus and Helen. They were also given instructions to take their armies and their ships and meet everyone else at Aulis. Aulis is, uh, I guess, kind of a uh, port city on the east coast of Greece. That will be the staging point of the invasion of Troy. So everybody's going there to meet up. Now, surprisingly, there really wasn't any problem getting guys to show up. The only two uh, heroes that didn't show up were Odysseus and Achilles. But I guess it makes sense seeing how Odysseus' kingdom of Ithaca is the furthest one away. And technically, uh, Achilles did not take the oath because he was too young to be there. But everyone knew this kid was fucking good. So we definitely need Achilles in this war. And also the Greek seer Calchas told the Greek commanders that the city of Troy would never fall without Odysseus and Achilles. So naturally everyone was like, all right, we got to get these guys. So Menelaus, Nestor, and Palamedes decided to board a ship and head towards Odysseus' kingdom of Ithaca. Now, Nestor is kind of the old curmudgeon from the old days, basically, but everyone respects him immensely for his knowledge, his wisdom, and uh, just, you know, he was a badass back in the day with Hercules and all the other heroes, so he's kind of also their connection to the old, glorious, legendary past, so they definitely respect Nestor. But uh, Nestor is kind of interesting, too, because he's kind of like that old guy. He's like, ah, back in my day. Yeah, so he's kind of interesting. I think he even says in uh, the Iliad, like, oh, in my youth, I could have taken the city of Troy by myself. You know, so he's kind of like that. But uh, he's very wise, very knowledgeable, and uh, they definitely need Nestor's help. And also, every uh, one of Nestor's sons goes off to fight in the Trojan War. So he's a, he's a pretty cool guy. Now let's hop over to the island of Ithaca, the kingdom of Odysseus. Now Odysseus is supposed to be a very intelligent, very clever man who's also a pretty good warrior. His father is Laertes and his mother is Anticlea. Now Laertes is a badass. He was a Argonaut and he helped take part in the uh, hunt for the Caledonian boar. And his mother is the daughter of the King of Thieves, Autolycus. So any of you who saw the TV show uh, Hercules, you probably remember Bruce Campbell from that, and that was his role on that show was uh, King of Thieves, Autolycus. So it's kind of cool that uh, there's a connection between Autolycus and Odysseus. It's probably where Odysseus gets his uh, cleverness from. But yeah, Odysseus was a good king. I think the people of Ithaca definitely loved him. And he had been married to Penelope now for a couple of years. They just had a son recently who they named Telemachus. And I'm sure by the time word got to him about what Paris had done, he's like, ah, shit. That means the kings of Greece are going to come and want me to fight in this war. So he went and uh, consulted an oracle who told him that he will survive the war, but it will take him many, many years to get back home. So when the... uh, ship bearing Menelaus, Nestor, and Palamedes showed up. Odysseus, using his cleverness, decided to pretend to be insane so that he wouldn't have to go. So he started making a lot of noise. Then he started like plowing his field with an ox and a uh, donkey, which would not really work properly because the ox would be pulling further than the uh, donkey would, so (laughs) he'd basically be eventually plowing in a circle. And uh, supposedly he also threw salt into his field. So everyone was kind of buying this. uh, Oh shit, Odysseus is crazy. 
until Palamedes, who himself was also pretty clever, figured out that Odysseus was just doing this to uh, stay out of the war. So Palamedes went over and picked up the uh, baby Telemachus and put it in front of Odysseus's plow, basically meaning that if Odysseus ran over his baby, he would be insane and they could leave him there. But if he didn't, then he's just full of shit. So naturally, Odysseus came close to uh, Telemachus, but naturally would not run over his only son. So he stopped and uh, picked up his son, and uh, everybody went, Ah, hello, Odysseus. You're coming with us. Fulfill your oath. I'm sure Odysseus was like, Fine. Great. And so reluctantly, Odysseus agrees to go and fight in the Trojan War, but he will never forgive Palamedes for finding him out and dragging him into this. He will get his revenge against him later. But for right now, he kisses his wife, Penelope, and his son, Telemachus, goodbye. Hops aboard the ship, along with Menelaus, Nestor, and Palamedes. And he will not see Ithaca or his wife and son again for 20 years. So they set sail, and Odysseus brings 12 warships with him. And I guess it probably took about a week or so for them to get the Aulus. But when they got there, I'm sure it was a hell of a sight. There would have been hundreds of ships beached there. There would have been tens of thousands of soldiers. I mean, the logistics of this would have been kind of crazy. But I'm dealing with the ancient sources here. This is what they tell us. Now, according to the uh, ancient sources, Agamemnon brought about 100 warships with him. That uh, probably would have had about 50 men each ship. So he brought the most ships. His brother Menelaus brought 60 ships. Nestor brought 90. So yeah, he was definitely a good guy to have around. And you had Idomeneus, the king of Crete. He brought 80 ships with him. Interesting side note, his grandfather was King Minos, who uh, basically kind of ran the uh, labyrinth that uh, held the Minotaur. And uh, King Minos shows up in uh, Dante's Inferno, so kind of interesting. But yeah, Idomeneus would be a damn good warrior for the Greeks. And speaking of damn good warriors, next up you got Ajax and his uh, half-brother Tesher. Now Ajax, as far as Greek warriors go, he's in the top three. I mean, he is a great warrior. Nobody is as big or as strong as Ajax. And according to Homer, he carries a shield that's made of seven bull hides with a layer of bronze. He's probably the only guy who can use this shield. I mean, this thing's got to be ginormous from the descriptions. And uh, his half-brother, Tesser, is probably the best Greek archer. Now, they share the same father, Telamon, who, like most of the other awesome fathers of the time, were, uh, he was a Argonaut and took part in the uh, hunt for the Caledonian boar. And he's also uh, Peleus' brother. So Ajax and Tesser would have been the cousins of Achilles. And along with Peleus, Telamon was good friends with Hercules, so that's pretty cool. But Tesser had a different mother than Ajax. In fact, his mother was a sister of King Priam. So that makes Priam Tesser's uncle, and Hector and all those guys uh, are Tesser's cousins. So that's got to be a little weird for him going to fight these guys. So yeah, kind of interesting. They only uh, bought 12 ships, though, but see now they're from the island of Salamis, so I guess that makes sense. And then you had Philoctetes, who was a very good archer. He only brought seven ships with him, but each one was manned by 50 men who were all archers, so that'll definitely be useful. And then we have the king of Argos, Diomedes, who's bringing 80 ships with him. Now, Diomedes is the youngest Greek king, but he's probably got the most military experience. He had to fight hard to get his kingdom. And as far as uh, Greek warriors go, like Ajax, he's in the top three. So it's really a toss-up between Diomedes and Ajax for uh, who's in second place behind Achilles. He will be a very, very important warrior as the war goes on. And it's kind of sad not too many uh, people mention him or talk about him, but in Homer's Iliad, he definitely rocks balls. And there was also a, another Ajax. They usually refer to this one as Ajax the Lesser. 
It's probably more of a size thing. I don't think uh, Ajax the Lesser is really a piece of shit or anything. I mean, he's supposed to be very good with a spear, and he's also the second fastest uh, Greek runner, only behind Achilles. And uh, he goes on to do some pretty crazy stuff, but I guess it's just, uh, you know, he could have just as easily been called Ajax the Shorter, but I guess I'll stick to uh, Homer and just refer to him as Ajax the Lesser and stick with uh, Big Ajax as just Ajax to avoid any confusion. So this was absolutely an amazing fleet, probably the greatest army ever assembled yet. But the only thing they were really missing was uh, Achilles and his soldiers. So, yeah, really impressive army. Now, when the ship carrying Menelaus and uh, Odysseus and Nestor and Palamedes landed, I'm sure everybody got right back to work, figuring out a strategy and what's left to do and stuff. Now, whether Odysseus did try to weasel out of fulfilling his oath, or if he didn't, um, it's pretty damn clear though, once he got into the war, he was absolutely essential to the war effort. I mean, he becomes Agamemnon's right-hand man, basically, so he definitely throws himself at this war, and, uh, definitely does some extremely important things in it. Now, according to some sources, I think I even came across, uh, Homer was saying this, but supposedly the Greeks sent a diplomatic mission to Troy headed by Menelaus and Odysseus to try and get Helen back through diplomatic means, and it failed, so they came back. But it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting idea. Um I wonder why it failed. I mean, did the Greeks ask for restitutions or something, and the Trojans said no? Or, I don't know. I wonder what happened. I wonder who the Trojans would have sent to do the uh, negotiating. You don't want to send Paris anywhere near Menelaus, so maybe they sent King Priam, or uh, maybe King Priam went with Hector or something, but I don't know. That had to be kind of interesting. It's kind of a shame that it failed if it even took place, but uh, I don't know. Of course, it could be uh, Greek propaganda to say they could say, well, we tried everything to end this peacefully, but I don't know, it's an interesting idea. But whatever, after uh, that, um, it was time to go and get Achilles. That was really the only thing this army was missing. Now, the question is for the uh, Greek kings and commanders where the hell to find Achilles? Somehow they tracked Achilles down to the island of Skyros. Not really sure how. I haven't really been able to find any sources or reasons why, but maybe they asked around uh, Peleus' uh, palace or whatever, and uh, everyone told them that Thetis took him somewhere, and maybe they just assumed some island somewhere because she was a water nymph, but, I mean, there's a lot of islands in Greece, so... Eh. But eventually they made their way to Skyros. Now, what had been going on in Skyros is uh, pretty interesting. Um, Achilles was going by the name Pyrrha, which meant basically redhead, because he had um, auburn color hair. I guess like a reddish golden hair color, I guess. But yeah, he was going by the name Pyrrha. And if you remember, Achilles had been sleeping with uh, Diadymia. So she one day comes forward to Achilles to tell him that she's pregnant. So, dun dun dun. And uh, probably around that time is when uh, Odysseus, Menelaus, and Nestor. And I believe they brought um, Achilles' old mentor, Phoenix, along to to help uh, find Achilles. The only person that they brought along who had ever seen Achilles was Phoenix. All the other guys had never seen him before. And Achilles has never seen any of the other guys. He's seen Phoenix. But it's probably been a couple of years since Phoenix has seen Achilles. And Achilles is dressed like a girl very convincingly. So they are unable to uh, spot Achilles. So Odysseus comes up with a pretty clever uh, plan. He and the other Greek commanders 
bought a chest out full of presents for the uh, princesses and ladies in waiting. And uh, they open the chest up. It's full of beautiful dresses, jewelry, mirrors, and weapons. So while all the girls are playing around with the dresses and stuff, Achilles starts to kind of mess around with the weapons. It's been so long since he's actually been able to touch one. And then, at Odysseus's signal, a war horn sounds in the distance. And everybody freaks out, but then Achilles jumps up, grabs a spear and shield, and starts to go out the door. But is stopped by a smiling Odysseus, who has just now tricked Achilles into revealing himself. So now Achilles is found, and he is told by the Greek commanders that they need him for the war in Troy. So he uh, readily agrees and uh, says goodbye to Diadymia, who is very distraught. Especially, I mean, she's like 15 years old and pregnant, and now, and now her, uh, I guess let's call him boyfriend, is leaving. So uh, she's very distraught and stuff, and he is too. It's not like Achilles really wants to leave her, but this is the war he was born for. So he says goodbye, and uh, unfortunately Achilles will never see his son, who was born a couple of months later. But we will see his son later on in the story. So after Achilles had said his goodbyes, he hopped on board the ship with the other Greek commanders, and they set sail for Peleus's kingdom. And I'm sure once Achilles got there, he was overjoyed to see his father and his best friend Patroclus again. I think even Thetis showed up there, so uh, so that was kind of a happy last get-together, I guess. Now, Peleus is pretty old by this time and kind of becoming feeble, so Achilles is definitely sad to leave his father. In fact, that was, uh, I think, one of the most touching moments in the Iliad, near the end when uh, Achilles is lamenting that he will never see his father again and that he will not be able to help him run his kingdom and take care of him and stuff, so that was kind of a touching moment in the Iliad, but that's another ten years away, so for right now... Achilles was probably just excited to be going off to war. Now, everyone had some parting gifts for Achilles. Peleus gave him his armor and a sword and stuff. I think Chiron gave Achilles the legendary spear that he carried in the battle. It was, uh, like a gigantic ash spear hewn from an ash tree on Mount Pelion. And supposedly Achilles was the only guy who can who could really uh, wield it, so that was a pretty cool gift. And uh, Thetis basically gave um, Achilles a couple of prophecies and stuff, basically telling him, don't be the first Greek to set foot on the Trojan shore, because whoever that is is destined to die, and a couple of other things. And I'm sure she also begged her son to not go to war, but Achilles has made up his mind. He's choosing to have a short life with glory over a long life without glory. And also, before leaving, his father Peleus gave him a chariot, and supposedly with two immortal horses to pull the uh, chariot. So, it's a pretty cool gift to receive. So, with all his uh, armor and weapons and chariot and horses aboard the ship, they set sail for Alice. I'm sure it was a very heartbreaking moment for Peleus and Thetis and uh, everything, but um, Achilles was ready for this war, and he brought Patroclus with him, who was also, I'm sure, eager for this war, and his father's soldiers he also brought with him. Now, Achilles brought about 50 warships with him, along with his father's elite Myrmidon troops, the uh, Myrmidons were legendary uh, soldiers who fought under Peleus and Achilles. Now, the word Myrmidon is kind of a weird thing. It means the ant people. Basically, it comes from Achilles' grandfather, Iacchus, who um, pleaded with Zeus after a deadly plague struck uh, his kingdom to uh, repopulate his kingdom. And Zeus said to uh, Iacchus, that his people would number as the ants on his sacred oak. And from the ants sprang the people of Egina, the Myrmidons. 
So basically, yeah, I'll repopulate your uh, kingdom, and they'll be as numerous as the ants. So that's where the word Myrmidons comes from. So with his army and his armor and his best friend by his side, Achilles was ready to enter the Trojan War.